Okay, members, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take the next item on the order paper. And the next item is a motion on the appointment of a Victims of Crime Commissioner. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly agrees that all victims of crime deserve to receive the same support following a criminal offence being perpetrated perpetrated against them and during any ju ju uh, judicial proceedings, and calls on the Minister of Justice to conduct a feasibility study into the appointment of a Victims of Crime Commissioner who would act as a focal point, champion and advocate, and bring forward best practice in dealing with and supporting victims of crime. Thank you. And I call Doug Beatty to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. And uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one and a half hours for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate on the motion. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for every crime, uh, there is a victim. Uh, there is no such thing uh, as a victimless crime. Uh, and therefore, in our society, we have got thousands uh, of victims. Victims suffering physically, victims suffering mentally, and victims suffering emotionally. Victims of antisocial behaviour, of scams, victims of burglaries, assaults, muggings, victims of fraud, domestic abuse, drink and drug driving, victims of murder. Of course, there are underlying reasons for crime, social economic reasons, poverty, disadvantagement, disengagement, drugs and alcohol abuse, our divided society, uh, and, of course, mental health issues. Addressing the causes of crime are fundamental to helping create less victims. And I am happy that these points are pointed out during this debate to allow for balance uh, and for understanding. But this motion is about looking at crime through the eyes of the victim, because only through the prism of the victim can we understand what they are going through? This Assembly will know that I have raised this issue uh, on multiple occasions, uh, on the floor, um, uh, in debate, in oral and written questions, uh, in the Justice Committee. This is not a vanity project. Uh, it is not a hobby horse subject. This is born out of listening to victims and trying to understand what they are going through as the investigation progresses, as a perpetrator is found or indeed is not found, the court case and what happens next. All of these things happen after the crime takes place and the victim has to deal with them in a rolling basis. In 2017, uh, I, I spoke to Charles Little, uh, and I know the Minister has spoken to, to Charles. Um, but I spoke to Charles in uh, 2017. Uh, his family, the Caudry family, lost their parents, Michael uh, and Marjorie um, Caudry, to a brutal murder by a mental health patient. They aren't alone in this. The murderer, Thomas Scott McEntee, was a mental health patient, and the failure to deal with this issue directly led to the murders. But speaking to Charles Little, um, it was clear that he had to go through a lot of these processes in dealing with the murder of his family members alone. They had to walk the path alone. They had to move out of their home because their home was now a crime scene and they had no help in moving out. They had to fight to understand what had happened to their family members what information they could get, who was responsible. And to their credit, and I say this to their credit, uh, they do not hold uh, Mr McEntee solely responsible for the murder uh, of their loved ones. Of course, we can all highlight victims who have not had the support that they deserve. Every one of us, I know we were, and that is from somebody who has suffered a burglary to somebody who has suffered a scam, right up to other issues. People such as Peter Dolan, whose son, N. Dolan, just 18 years old, was killed by a drug and drink driver. Horrific, horrendous circumstances, and many of you will have spoken to him and will know this. 
Peter needed help when his son was killed. He needed support during the court case. He needed understanding as he fought for a tougher sentence to the perpetrator. He still needs that today. He has not stopped being a victim. The perpetrator will be released after four and a half years behind bars for for the the killing um, of Enda. And Mr Dolan is going to have to deal with that again. And these are the issues that we need to look at, is how do we support these people in whole life support? In July this year, the Criminal Justice Inspectorate released its support Uh, its report on victims and witnesses. It highlighted that many victims just do not understand their rights and do not know how to access support. Of course, there was an obligatory recommendation that the police and the Victims and Witnesses Care Unit needs more training. And of course they need more training, because training is endless, development uh, is endless. But also in the report, was that there was too much emphasis put on process and that hindered meaningful engagement with victims and the impact the crime was having on them and having on their families. There is a victim's charter in place, but who is the champion for it? Who makes sure it's up to date? Who makes sure it's fit for purpose? Who champions it? In the Queen's speech in December 2019, uh, new legislation to support victims of crime and their families was announced. This new legislation is being driven forward now by uh, Alex Chalk MP with the Victims Commissioner for England and Wales promoting the voice of the victim to inform that legislation. Who is doing similar for Northern Ireland? Who is promoting the voice of the victim at the highest level? The charity Victims NI is doing a fantastic job and I know people will mention them today, but they need support. Who is or who could be liaising with Alex Chalk MP about new legislation? Who could be informing the domestic abuse bill from a victim's perspective? And I'm going to mention now uh, and and commend uh, the chair and the vice chair of the Justice Committee and the committee itself for the work that they've done in scrutinising the domestic abuse bill. I think it's been truly fantastic. And the issue about a domestic abuse commissioner Uh, has been raised on multiple occasions. Who could be feeding into the sentencing review and consultation on behalf of the victim or the new hate legislation? The answer is a dedicated victim of crimes commissioner whose sole remit is to ensure support for victims of crime. That's their job. That's what they do. And I note the two amendments to this motion that came forward from Alliance Party and the DUP. And I will say that I would have been minded to support both amendments because both amendments added value to the, to the motion and it addressed the, the issue in hand. So today, I am hoping the Justice Minister will am- announce something substantive, that she is minded to appoint a Victims of Crime Commissioner and possibly link into the legislation presently going through Westminster, if not in the full term, certainly in the short term, because this mandate is so short. Uh, If unable to do so, I hope there is an interim commissioner until one is put on a statutory footing. What is clear, Mr Speaker, until we start looking at some of these issues through the eyes of the victims, we are going to continually fail them, if not directly than indirectly. This motion is absolutely a blunt instrument. It looks at the issue through primary colours. I accept that. There are far more issues to be added to this, to to be debated on this, and I'm sure they will be raised here, uh, and I hope they are, because we need that balance. But what victims of crime need, all victims of crime, from the lowest crime to the highest crime, is somebody who is going to fight their corner. And when something goes wrong, when something is not right, that person is the person who will go and liaise with the Justice uh, Minister or liaise with other agencies to put it right. That's the important part. Therefore, I hope this Assembly 
can join me in supporting this motion because it's not contentious, because we all know victims out there. We have all dealt with them and we all want to do the best for them. And I believe that a Victims of Crime Commissioner is the first step in doing that. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Paul Given. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, can I thank the member uh, for bringing forward the motion which we uh, will be uh, supporting? Um, I am disappointed, though, that the motion needed to be brought forward, um, and I want to elaborate on that. In 2012, the Victims Commission, or the uh, Justice Committee, sorry, uh, which I chaired, uh, launched an inquiry into the experiences of victims and witnesses of the criminal justice system. I think I might be the only member of that committee that's still on the Justice Committee now today via some other changes in, in, in that path. At the time, Raven McCartney was the Vice Chairman, Tom Elliott was an Ulster Unionist representative, and Alban McGuinness uh, represented the SDLP along with then some other members. But that committee gathered extensive evidence. I remember being in the North West, listening to victims talking about their experience and how they had been let down by the criminal justice system. That included those that were family members who had lost their loved ones through murder, to those that had uh, engaged in smaller uh, criminal impacts upon them of burglary and theft. And we heard the devastating impact that the whole spectrum of crimes had upon victims. And we heard then how they felt let down by the system. That committee uh, produced a unanimous report that made comprehensive recommendations in 2012. And here we are, eight years later, and the issues that were being raised then are being raised today. Now, whenever assembly committees produce reports, they're not meant to go on a shelf. And committees follow up on that, as the Justice Committee followed up on it uh, on numerous occasions. And there have been some of those recommendations that have been implemented, a Victims and Witness Care Unit something that members went over to Great Britain. We've seen it firsthand how that was working. And those victims and witness care units came online here in Northern Ireland. And the, the latest Criminal Justice Inspectorate report highlights that there is good work taking place in those units. Uh, but there could be much more to be done. That committee also recommended that there should be a victim's charter, which then became legislation in 2015, which sets down legal rights that victims uh, have to be afforded to. The Sajini report and an investigation found that not one victim of crime that they had spoken to was aware of the victim's charter. Not one. And yet it is a legal document that enshrines rights upon those victims. And the basic kind of uh, information and way in which they engage with statutory authorities should be afforded to them. The report went on and, and highlights how uh, the PSNI uh, often uh, would just deal with the, the Charter as a tick box exercise and misses the victim behind the process that they're following. And so if we're going to have a victims-centred criminal justice system, there needs to then be change. And whenever this House, through the committee, recommended change, when we have the Sajini report eight years later highlighting some aspects that are good but other aspects that have failed, it needs to be listened to. And some of the recommendations talks about change at leadership level. Four strategic recommendations in the Sajini report, 12 operational recommendations. Of the strategic ones, it talks about leadership within the Department of Justice. And that's where we look to the minister. As we look to the previous minister, David Ford, at the time when the committee worked with him and produced that report, and good work was done. So we need leadership driven at the top. The report recommends how those involved in senior leadership positions in the Department of Justice need to be active members of the Victims and Witness Unit steering group. Now, to many people, that would seem to make sense, and it shouldn't require a report to make that recommendation. But nevertheless, it does. And so I would like to hear from the Minister committing that the senior leadership within her department will become active members of the steering group and provide that kind of oversight, because the report highlights how those units can be very beneficial at gathering the right kind of information that then can be extrapolated across the criminal justice system and real meaningful change can take place. And so that's where we come to the motion. Based upon the evidence of 2012 and what the member for Upper Ban has brought now and the criticism in the Sejenery report, that requires at a minimum 
the feasibility study for a victim's commissioner of crime because there needs to be accountability and we need structures put in place to hold ministers to account. I would ask the, the member department. to draw his remarks to a close. The please. committee will continue to do this work and I support the motion because more clearly needs to be done. I thank the, the member for bringing it. Iram Sir Linda Dillon, on can I call Linda? I think that much of what has been said, both by the proposer, and I thank you for bringing the, the motion to the House today, and, and by the Chair of the Committee, will probably be repeated across this House today, which maybe lends to we, we possibly should have looked at something as a, as a committee motion, um, which obviously carries with it some weight, and I think that, it, that that has value. However, the motion is here, and I think that probably you will be getting support across the House. I'm sure that it will be carried, and therefore, hopefully the Minister will, will give a positive response. I think that it is good in terms of asking for the feasibility study because that shows that you are starting at the right starting point, not just saying we need something, but saying look at what we need, if we need it, what, you know, what, I suppose, what responsibility should be given to that Commissioner. So I think all of that is extremely important. And our starting point obviously is that we have to look to victims first. And that is victims right across the board. So we have everything from as we've all heard over recent months, and in my role as, as Deputy Chair of the Justice Committee, have heard many of those who have suffered domestic abuse at every level, whether it's physical, whether it's coercive, whether it's sexual abuse, all of the different types of abuse, abuse where children are involved and other family members. So all of this is, is, I suppose, really important in terms of highlighting to us why victims actually do need to be listened to. And I think that that is what we need to look to going forward. And what Paul has outlined previously shows that the report is there, all of the evidence is there. But there are many reports and recommendations out there. So there is the Gillen report and recommendations. There are many, many others. And I think maybe as a committee, that's what we need to do. Look at what reports and recommendations are there and see what has been implemented, what could actually have an impact. And in the absence of the Victims Commissioner, what can we do to ensure that they are implemented? So we, we as a committee have a, a lot of work to do, but it's about holding our minister to account. Our work is about holding the minister to account and ensuring that the recommendations that are made to the department are carried out and to all of the other organisations too, whether it's PSNA or any other of the, the organisations. There are a number of different um, models in terms of victim support and, and advocacy, and I think that we need to look to all of those and look at what you know, what is involved and what they cover. So there, there are models, obviously, there's a model in the South and it has quite an extensive um, role and again across the water in England and Wales. Scotland have decided not to go with a victim's commissioner. That doesn't mean that that's the right approach and that's why I think that the member's motion is, is an excellent motion in terms of asking us to look at the feasibility and looking at all of the other models out there. And none of those might be the example which we follow. There may be, well be other better models across the world. and we, did, we need to look at what is the best model, what is the best practice, because we shouldn't just have a very narrow view and look within these islands. We need to look at what is the best model. And we should be looking to what is in place in the 26 counties, England, Wales and Scotland, and seeing what is missing there, what is wrong there. Because what, whenever we do, or what we do, we want it to be better, not the same. So I think that that, that is important for us moving forward. As I've already outlined, over recent months we've been scrutinising the domestic abuse bill, and in that we have, as, as the members have already alluded to, we have looked at the, the value of a specific commissioner around domestic abuse. And I think as part of this feasibility study, all of those issues can be looked at, and I don't think that, that members would disagree. I think we do need to look at all of that. But there is an, an issue of equity here. So we need to ensure that all victims have the same representation, that all victims are looked after in the same way, regardless of what, what they are the victim of, whether it is homicide, whether it is domestic and sexual violence, or whether, whether it is antisocial behaviour. And the importance of it is knowing that that person is there to help you. So what Mr Beatty has already outlined, or, or rather, sorry, Mr Given has already outlined around the victim's charter, and victims not even knowing that it was there, that is, you know, to, to, for victims not to know that's there, it should be the very first thing they're told about whenever they become a victim. You have rights as a victim. So if we're going to have a victim's commissioner or whatever model the minister chooses to bring forward after the feasibility study, we need to ensure that victims understand what that model is and what it can do for them and how they access it, because that is 
vital in all of this. There is no value in having a commissioner for anything if the people who need to rely on that commissioner don't understand how it works and don't understand I would how ask they the member to draw it remarks to a close, and how it will actually benefit them. Thank you. We will be supporting the motion today. Iram Sir Sinead Bradley Hon Kanchek call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, as the SDLP Justice Spokesperson, I too rise to support this motion, uh, which calls for the Minister to conduct a feasibility study into the appointment of a victor's, victim of crimes commissioner. The members Doug Beatty and Robbie Butler, I want to thank for bringing this forward today because it is quite timely as we discuss the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. At the outset, I too want to refer to the Victims' Charter, which I understand was brought to a statutory footing in 2015. On inspection of that charter, it is actually a very worthy document. It contains much good information, and it is certainly a good starting point in terms of what information should be shared with victim, victims as soon as they are identified as being victims. There is no doubt it is impressive, and it is thorough. But what is concerning is the fact that we have very little knowledge on how well that information is being used. And in fact, the chair of the committee today pointed to the very good example in the report where there was evidence that it is not being used at all. So with all respect to the Victims' Charter, and I do commend it as a worthwhile document, it has zero value if it is sitting on a shelf and not being used and victims are not being made aware of it. To that mind, I would, I would put it to the Minister um, that we have to ask serious questions about that charter. Do we know how it is being utilised across all agencies and areas? How often is it being revisited and updated? And what process is in place to make sure that it is activated and used? There is obviously evidence that it is not, and the mover of the motion today rightly pointed to one case in particular, Mr Dolan, which is evidence of that also. And there are other cases that most of us will be aware of across our constituencies. So there are many questions that really we have to ask around what would the role of a victim, victim's commissioner look like and would this be within their scope? And I most certainly hope it would be, that the, that the charter itself would be one of the lead pieces of work. But of course, we also, anybody who is in this chamber and also sits on the Justice Committee, will know the deliberations, the repeated deliberations we have had on how effective the domestic abuse bill could be um, without there being adequate training an adequate follow-up and somebody to oversee that the legislation was actually being enacted. Because again, legislation, while well and good, and it may be a, the finest piece of legislation ever crafted, but unless there is somebody to oversee it and ensure every letter of it is enacted, then it, becomes to, it also would lead to having zero value. So the question has routinely arisen across many cases and in many situations is who is the voice? Who is the overall guardian of everything we hold important to that to support a victim? And right now there is enough evidence for us to put the question, is, there, is this the time to carry out the feasibility study and look at who is that guardian? And to my mind, the Victims Commissioner, as proposed in the motion, is certainly a good start. So I do commend the motion and I certainly support it. And I would ask the Minister to take a broad and open mind to what that feasibility study might include, because there are many issues surrounding vic victims that need to be addressed at this time. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call John Blair. Speaker, thank you, and I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party to support the motion, though I should probably at the outset make clear that I see the motion as a framework on which to build a more comprehensive and operative support system in which all victims of crime receive a level of support which is suitable to their individual circumstances and requirements. The circumstances, of course, Deputy Speaker, surrounding each crime are different. The needs of each individual victim are different. Therefore, the support that they receive should be tailored and appropriate to their needs, taking into account the, the nature of the crime and the victim's experience to ensure they receive an effective service and support as, as they proceed through the justice system. For example, a victims of hate crime who have experienced a personal attack 
because of their race, religious belief, sexual orientation, gender identity or even disability may, may have endured and experienced a lifetime of discrimination, Deputy Speaker, and they are going to require a tailored approach to victim support. We need to consider also in the context of the motion and debate the importance of victims to the policing scenario, the complexities of motivated hate crime and effective policing practices. Hate crime has become, you could argue, a gauge for contemporary police relations with vulnerable and marginalised communities. So, so we consider the importance of how we police effectively and how police can lead conversations with such communities about crimes arising from prejudice. History of under-policing these communities of victims of crime, of course, is a very separate issue and is also part of the picture. Uh, and it's essential that we view that picture overall, Deputy Speaker, not as a specific need, however important that need may be, but as part of the overall justice scene. It is important that the system provides support to victims of hate crime through the criminal justice process and signpost them on to relevant services through their ongoing struggles for equality and for justice. I, uh, Deputy Speaker, welcome the Department's announcement last year to tackle the intolerable hate crime and to carry out an independent review of hate crime legislation in Northern Ireland. Many parties here will have already engaged with Ju Judge Marin in review of hate crime, and it is reassuring that the Department is fully engaged in that process. I also welcome the Minister's announcement to establish a reference group to advise and inform on the requirement and necessity of a Victims of Crime Commissioner. So, Deputy Speaker, mindful of future solutions and improvements to our victim support system and to ensure effective service delivery, I am supportive of the motion and indeed what it proposes. I am also hopeful that the motion and any outcomes from today's debate will be complementary to progress already made, will be considered in conjunction with processes already underway and, most importantly, will be taken forward with the individual needs of all victims as a top priority for us all. I call Paul Frew. Thank you much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I rise to support the motion. But I like my, my colleague, Mr. Given. The first frustration question, frustrating question I ask is why the need? Surely, in this day and age, in the liberal democracy for which we live, justice should be an ultimate right. What is justice, or what in fact is a duty on government, devolved or otherwise, other than to keep its people safe and to establish and maintain justice? What is justice? Justice is a balance. Justice is a balance. When somebody commits a crime, the victim then can expect redress and closure if they can. They are compensated in a number of ways. That can come in various guises uh, with regards to that compensation. But there is balance. So if a government can't even produce balance, then you have to ask the question, what good is that government to its people? And that's the fundamental question that we're really debating here. And if we're saying to ourselves as a legislator that we need a victim's commissioner, we need a victim's commissioner, even though we have a justice system. Then you have to ask yourself, how is the justice system working? And what we can see through the evidence, and of course government cogs turn very slowly, and yes it is clear, and it's a reality, that justice has only been devolved recently. But that shouldn't be the excuse for doing nothing. That shouldn't be the excuse for when we do rule out improvement that it becomes a tick box exercise. It shouldn't be an excuse when you have countless Sejini reports talking about the failures of the justice system and you have countless committee reports, committee of justice reports, seeking redress and a better way for victims, but yet nothing is done or it becomes a tick box exercise. Now, there is nobody in this society deserves that. And when they are victims of crime, they have to be supported by the actual justice system that is in place to protect 
their rights, to give them equal treatment in this country and within the law. And when they become a victim, then there should be redress. But to hear the horror stories that the victims charter and all of its significance and all its importance when it was brought in is being treated like a tick box exercise. Well, to me, you look at the fundamentals of this and you can see very rapidly, very quickly, how the justice system can rapidly fall down, where it can feel the victim, the very people it's designed to protect, but it will fail them time and time again. It is not easy to suffer crime. No one here should wish crime on anyone and, and for victims to be, to be created. But when you do become a victim and you do have to go through a process of inquiry, of answering questions, of being placed in a court, and that's horrendous. And, and the system of our court is very robust. And there's reasons for that. But just because we have a very robust justice system, which can be very confrontational within the actual court itself, that is not a reason not to support the very victims the justice system there is designed to do. So yes, I, of course we will support the feasibility study on the appointment of a Victims of Crime Commissioner. But the fundamental question that we as legislators must ask ourselves is this. Why the need? Why have we got to a place where we need a commissioner to look after victims when the justice system itself should be the very instrument that seeks redress for those victims and supports them? With all the legal professions, with all the systems, the clear, bound systems of justice. I'd ask the member to draw his remarks How to a close, please. How are we in a position where we are now looking and seeking a commissioner for victims when the justice system should do that ably? Thank you. Here I'm, sir, Emma Rogan, on I call Emma Rogan. I welcome this motion and the following debate. As mentioned by other speakers, as a member of the Justice Committee, it is a revealing experience as we have heard evidence from a number of key stakeholders and organisations, including many victims of crime. It has reinforced my views and the views of many of my colleagues as to the importance of supporting victims of crime and making their journey through criminal justice system less harrowing, more efficient, and to better support policy and legislation, which ensures that there is less crime prevalent in our communities and therefore less victims of crime. At this early stage, I express my support for the motion. This is not necessarily consent to the establishment of a commissioner for victims of crime, but I do support the calls for a feasibility study into the potential establishment of a commissioner by weighing up all the potential benefits that it might have. This study should also explore all other further options for best supporting victims, ensuring their voices are heard and reflected in the development of strategies and policy and to fill any existing gaps. Some of my colleagues have already discussed, for example, the decision of the Scottish Government not to proceed with the Victims Commissioner. However, there are other jurisdictions where Victims Commissioners have been very effective and efficient use of resources. Therefore, all options and models of best practice should be explored. Victims have a number of rights and entitlements which are laid out in the Victims Charter, and it is important that these rights are not only fully respected by all, but that these rights are actively promoted and that victims of crime are informed of these rights. The Victims Charter, which was launched in 2015, followed a successful and highly useful report by the Justice Committee in 2012 into the criminal justice services available to victims and witnesses of crime. The report, which was widely welcomed at the time, was very important in highlighting the gaps that existed in terms of ensuring victims of crime were supported, that they had access to their rights and relevant information about the criminal justice process. I welcome today, today's debate, which is the latest effort of a renewed focus in the Assembly on supporting victims in the criminal justice system. In terms of the rights and entitlements of victims of crime, a potential victims commissioner may indeed be the best place to coordinate this, which the feasibility study should explore. This follows on from the latest criminal justice inspectorate report of the treatment of victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system from July of this year.
which recognises that whilst many improvements have been made since the first report 14 years ago, there still remains a number of gaps which can impact public confidence and could deter victims from reporting crime. Therefore, there is a notable gap which could be filled by a commissioner or other support services. I also want to pay tribute to the vital contribution of organisations such as Victim Support. In the field of supporting victims, they provide emotional support, information and practical help to victims and witnesses, and their work is crucially important. A Victims Commissioner or any other alternative model of support would be intended to complement and support the vital work of these support services. Myself and my Sinn Féin colleagues pledge to support victims and commit to improving their knowledge and their experiences. I would also call on the Minister for Justice to indicate a timeline for this feasibility study to be carried out. Thank you. I call Gordon Dunn. Mr Dunn. I welcome the opportunity to speak on this matter today as a member of the Justice Committee. Victims of crime do indeed deserve a proper level of support following a criminal offence being committed against them. We very much believe that victims must be at the very heart of the criminal justice system and the victim-centred approach around the justice system must always be a number one priority for the Justice Department. The July 2020 report published by the Criminal Justice Inspectorate Northern Ireland does provide a useful and interesting evidence base as its findings around the treatment of victims and witnesses within the, Chris, the criminal justice system. While launching her recent report, the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice in Northern Ireland, Jackie Durkin, did acknowledge that improvements have been made over recent years in how victims and witnesses are treated through the criminal justice system. Whilst there has been undoubtedly been some improvements in victim support, there is rec recognition that much more must be done to ensure better outcomes for victims, including bereaved families and witnesses. Some of the findings do cause concern. Many victims and witnesses of crime, some five years on from the Charter's launch, still remain totally unaware of their rights to, to support information services and protection measures through their long journey and far beyond. The Charter, the charter launched in 2015 by a previous Justice Minister was a positive development in helping to ensure that victims keep the minimum standards they should expect from the justice system. Many victims and witnesses of crime understandably are often more as familiar, not as familiar with the justice system as some experience perpetrators may be, and that is why clearly defined and effective measures must be put in place to support them. The recent July report also highlighted a major issue of a lack of awareness, as the, the Chairman of the Committee has already mentioned, of the Charter, and what it means in terms of the rights and entitlements for victims and witnesses of crime. It was alarming that some of those interviewed by, for the report had very little or no knowledge of the Charter at all being in place. There is a gap in terms of community awareness, and we must focus on encouraging greater ownership of the Charter, providing reassurance and active engagement in the system and the processes. I would ask the Minister to take action to address this gap, which will ultimately improve and strengthen victim support. There is need for a joined-up, comprehensive approach to supporting victims across the criminal justice system in championing victims' rights. I do believe action is needed, whether that is through a standalone commissioner post or through another form of consistently or another form to consistently monitor and benchmark the Charter's implementation across the process and help champion victim support. The ongoing COVID nineteen pandemic has also presented unique challenges for victims of crime, with the lack of court business being conducted during the lockdown period, when only, in many cases, emergency matters are being dealt with virtually. Even today, there are still significant backlogs of court business, and the virtual measures do limit full engagement and participation in the justice system, and often has an adverse impact on getting justice and ultimately support for victims. I recognise that some, advantage, some advances have been made, 
but I do believe more could be done, and that is why I am happy to support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Here I'm Sir Gemma Dolan, Hon Kanche. Call Gemma Dolan. Um, I don't think anyone in this chamber would disagree that all victims of crime deserve to receive the same support following a criminal offence being perpetrated against them and during any judicial proceedings. The Victim Charter, as already has been referred to, was launched in January 2015 and was anticipated to advise victims of crime about their entitlements and the standards of service that they can expect to receive when they come in contact with the criminal justice system. Victims need access to services that are fit for purpose. Each victim and witness in the criminal justice system has their own needs. The need to be listened to and the need to believe to have been heard. Providing services and support tailored to their requirements runs parallel with ensuring that victims and witnesses get the personal help they need. However, a criminal justice inspection report from July of this year found that victims and witnesses remained fundamentally unaware of their rights to information, support and protection, and that services to assist them were still not being consistently delivered to a quality standard. Obviously, when the criminal justice system fails to do this, it has a negative impact on public confidence in the justice system and could deter victims from reporting crime. The inspection also identified there were often too much focus by the criminal justice organisations on statistics, meeting targets and independence, and insufficient emphasis on personal experiences which often had a lifelong impact on the victim, their families and those closest to them. And whilst the inspection did not specify that a Victims of Crime Commission be established, it did state that substantial work is needed to raise awareness within the community about the Victim Charter and Witness Charter. The Minister has stated earlier this year that while the introduction of a Victims Commissioner is not being proposed by her department at this time, no final decision has been taken. She also stated her intention to explore ways in which her department can further develop new services or deliver existing support and protections more effectively. Our neighbouring jurisdictions all have different forms of victim support, but the one I find the most interesting is Scotland, which my colleagues have referred to, where they don't currently have a Victims of Crime Commissioner. But in a response to a parliamentary question in 2018, the Secretary for Justice responded saying, we remain of the view that funding for victim support organisations is a more effective use of resources. Those organisations represent the interests of victims and provide robust input to government consultation and the development of policy. We are learning from their experiences in order to better inform and design support services and to ensure their voices will be heard. So although I do support the motion and calls for a feasibility study, I would need to see the details and potential impact of any proposed commissioner before concluding on the best and most effective method of supporting victims, listening to and amplifying the voices of victims and ensuring victim services and policy are of the higher standard. Goromayogat. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. I also rise on behalf of the Alliance Party and will, of course, be supporting the motion. Indeed, the motion provides a very welcome opportunity to restate to the House that the Minister has already announced over the summer that she will be bringing forward a reference group to engage with representative organisations in the community and voluntary sector to explore the role and remit of a new Victims of Crime Commissioner for Northern Ireland. This, in fact, goes well beyond the motion, as it is a commitment not to whether there should be a Commissioner, but how. I know at the time in the summer that the sector was delighted by the announcement, as were individuals like Mr Charles Little, with whom I have been working and who have been calling for this position for many years, including during the suspension of the Assembly. So I am sure the proposers of the motion and the whole House will recognise that it is great to see the Justice Minister put in place this first practical step through this reference group, not just to consider the feasibility, but to drive the process clearly forward. The reason the Minister was so determined to push this forward was that there was so much value has um, been seen in the Victims Commissioner for England and Wales. This role has proven very important in providing a strong voice for victims, their families and notably also to those voluntary sector groups who provide services to them. We do not need to look beyond home, however, to see clear evidence of the value of an independent advocate for victims of crime. Each one of us is motivated and disgusted by the callous nature in which victims are tar targeted, often chosen because of their isolation or other vulnerability. 
As long ago as 2012, in the Justice Committee's inquiry into criminal justice, victims and witnesses of crime, it was, it was recognised that victims and witnesses have individual needs and some will require much more support and information than others. Therefore, we do, not, we do need to be careful here with the definition of same support mentioned in the motion. What we really mean is equal access to appropriate services and support. But these will differ from case to case. What is important that the, is that the Commissioner's work produces clear outcomes for all victims and that all victims feel supported. These outcomes may come in the form of amendments to existing programmes or services, the introduction of new services and policies to aid um, victims, or simply a voice for victims to know that they are not alone. The important part is that services, support and advocacy is more appropriate to the needs of victims than is currently the case and that it is accessible in a timely manner. It is inevitable that this will also mean the role involves linking with other advocates on behalf of those marginalised by or vulnerable to crime. So it is important that there is clarity of the role of the Commissioner and how the post holder will work with existing victims advocacy groups and then interact with the Justice Department and criminal justice system. In the summer, we also saw the launch of the Criminal Justice Inspection Report of the Care and Treatment of Victims and Witnesses by the Criminal Justice System, which is another reason why this post needs to move forward. The review identified that crimes can have a long, lifelong and wide-ranging impact on the victim. One of these impacts is, sadly, almost invariably on mental well-being. That is why, for me, one core connection will surely be with the interim mental health champion. As I, see, no doubt the, as I have no doubt the proposer of the motion will keenly recognise. For as we know, the emotional trauma and impact from being a victim of crime is devastating and may take many years to get over that trauma, if at all. I would again take this opportunity to argue that the forthcoming mental health strategy to be brought forward needs to happen more swiftly than currently proposed, not least to ensure that a clear framework a mechanism for delivering psychological therapies and support necessary to help victims rebuild their lives um, can link into the work of this Commissioner. We have talked a lot about the needs of various groups of victims in this chamber, be they the victims of historical institutional abuse, the troubles, patients experience alleged physical abuse in our health facilities, victims of domestic and sexual crime. And it is clear that this Assembly wants to do everything in its power to support them and put in place structures and policies to respond to their practical and emotional needs. But we do need to show more urgency and that's why I very much support the work of the Minister in taking this forward. So in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to place on record my admiration and appreciation for the work of the victims, support I NI, ask member to draw remarks to close, NSPCC please. and other groups who provide such valuable support to victims and their families in dark and daunting times. Thank you. Call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, crime can affect victims in many different ways. Uh, they may suffer injuries during the course of the crime, possibly even life-changing. They may carry psychological scars for a very long time as a result of the trauma of the crime. Or they may simply have to deal with practical outcomes of the crime that may be purely logistical or financial. If a perpetrator is brought before the court, the victim may be required to stand in the same courtroom a few yards apart from them and recount in detail what happened to them. Very few of us are fully equipped to deal with such situations. The courtroom is an alien environment for law-abiding people. The police do a good job in trying to keep the victims of crime informed of the progress of their investigations, but have limited resources to continue this line of communication and contact over a lengthy period. Having a family retail business that has had its fair share of robberies that normally have come with either direct violence or the very real threat of it, possibly drug fueled uh, the aftermath of such a crime can linger with the victims, and if it comes to court, the time spent on those unfamiliar and daunting surroundings can be a lonely and stressful experience preceded by many sleepless nights. From that personal experience, I, I understand the effect of crime uh, on victims, and indeed a young member of my family had to arrange herself uh, counselling after having a gun put to her mouth and suffered nightmares and flashbacks for some time afterwards. 
Last week, the House held a debate around the possible introduction of Helen's Law. This was driven by the sterling efforts of two families, the Dorians and the Murrays. Both these families have spoken highly of the support the police have offered them, but I would think that a Victim of Crime Commissioner could provide families like them with a more formal line of communication and support. I believe the contributions to that debate last week pointed up the pressing need and the positive help and support all families that are victims of crime need and deserve. We hear a lot about protecting the rights of those who are arrested on suspicion of committing a crime. Their rights are fully protected during a subsequent court case, and indeed this protection continues whilst they are serving a custodial sentence. This is all as it should be, and is a complement to the type of society that we are. Why would we therefore neglect or ignore the rights of victims of crime? Those who choose to commit crime knowingly make that decision. Those who become victims do not have that choice. A feasibility study into the possibility of a victim of crime commissioner would be a good starting point to show that we are serious about victims, and I would commend this motion to the House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, De Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on this motion today as a member of the Justice Committee and thank the members for bringing it forward. As others have already mentioned, this year's Criminal Justice Inspection Report was published makes it clear that we are still not doing enough to support victims and witnesses of crime. The report included a raft of, of recommendations and information to deal with key issues, and the most worrying fact of all is the Chief Inspector's statement that many other members have already alluded to, that victims and witnesses remain fundamentally unaware of their rights to information, support and protection, and that services to assist them were not being consistently delivered to a quality standard across Northern Ireland. That's just not good enough. And I hope that the, member will, or the Minister will set out in her response how the Department intends to address each recommendation. The Department's Victim and Witness Action Plan 2017-2020 is fast approaching its expiration date. So what plans does the Minister and the Department have to replace it? What plans are there to conduct a fully independent and detailed evaluation of its implementation and delivery? And what's next for the Department to ensure that key issues are being addressed? I fully understand the rationale for bringing this motion today and recognise that victims of non-troubles related incidents currently have no advocate or voice to support them and guide them through the criminal justice system. As some will say funding for victim support organisations is more effective use of resources and indeed that's the current position of the Scottish Government. But have we listened to the victim support organisations and what are they saying? Victims of Sport Northern Ireland have indicated that they would support the creation of a commissioner and the Criminal Justice Inspections Report also highlights the need. Victim Support have said that such a role should have the appropriate power, resources and independence from government to be able to hold all agencies to account and uphold the rights of victims under the Victim Charter. Similarly, Women's Aid have actively campaigned for the specific commissioner to tackle domestic abuse and I also believe this to be essential given the significant proportion of all crime, recorded and unrecorded, that is linked to domestic abuse and violence. It is a mechanism for scrutinising legislation, policy, practice, commissioning, funding and provision. And as other members have alluded to, gathering evidence and working on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, it has become clear to me that more needs to be done to support victims and witnesses, especially measures that speed up the criminal justice system. Time and time again, we have heard from key stakeholders that the high attrition rate of witnesses was largely due to delays in the cases and lack of support, awareness and understanding of the system. Indeed, Dame Vera Baird, QC, the Victims Commissioner for England and Wales, was fully supportive of moves to introduce the new office. And there is an urgent need in Northern Ireland to provide better support for survivors of abuse and help address the high attrition rate of witnesses. And I've called previously and will do again for the full implementation of the recommendations arising out of Gillen. Within Gillen Review, page 87, paragraph 2.87, stated, The interviews that I'd had with complainants frequently raised the issue of the trial process itself re-traumatising them. Mr Deputy Speaker, all victims and survivors must be treated with respect and dignity in their journey through the criminal justice system, including in the trial process, and it must support them. Perhaps the Minister can also indicate the level of progress that the Department is making in that regard with regard to Gillen. 
Victims and witnesses are entitled to know their rights, to be aware of the support available and information to guide them. And in 2012, England and Wales appointed a Victims Commissioner and have a designate now in place since 2019 for domestic abuse. They recognise the significance that the role can play in scrutinising, advising and being a powerful voice, and it is time that we did the same. Call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm not at all hostile to this motion, but I do have some questions as to where, if we travel down this road, it would fit within the existing infrastructure. Because I think the last thing we need is duplication, because duplication means needless expenditure. So some of the questions I would have are issues such as this. We already have a commissioner for victims and survivors. Would that post be superseded by a general commissioner for victims of crime? Or indeed, would a commissioner for victims of crime reflect the outrageous situation of the commissioner for victims and survivors that it also represents and includes victim makers? There are other areas where there are advocates who are funded by the state, a number of charities, Victim Support, uh, NSPCC, uh, Women's Aid, all getting generous grants, or maybe not in some cases as generous as the organisations think they should be. But again, where would those fit in? Are those then to be superseded by a Victims Commissioner's Office, or would you have any duplication required or funding? Sure. Thank you, and I appreciate the member taking the intervention. In relation to women's aid, rather than actually taking on the role that we, we would envisage for a Commissioner, they actually have a supporting role. They provide refuge and things such as that. So the Commissioner's role would actually be to support what women's aid are doing and to advocate perhaps on their behalf if they need additional funding. So would you agree that there is actually potential for those two roles to be complementary rather than to be against each other? Thank you. Member has an extra minute. I do understand that women's aid through hostels and all sorts of things do, do much more than, than what a victim's commissioner would be doing. And to that extent, there is a complementarity uh, obvious there. But there also is the, is the possibility of duplication. Uh, and I'm back to my point that duplication means waste resource, wasted resources. So I would like to see very clearly, before we get down this road, uh, an emphatic delineation of what it is the Victims Commissioner would do that others isn't doing and that others wouldn't continue to do that which the Victims Commissioner is doing. Because otherwise, I think we are creating a bureaucracy which maybe isn't serving a great deal of advancement. So I think, yes, there is a role for a victim's commissioner, but it has to be defined within the context of what knock-on effect that has upon existing structures elsewhere. Uh, you know, do, do you have two commissioners for victims of terrorist crime? Do you have the, commissioner, the victim's commissioner uh, the Commissioner for Victims and Survivors, and do you have the Crime Commissioner? Um, I, I don't know, but uh, you know, we have an advocate, for example, for historical abuse. Yes, it's different. There's unlikely to be many prosecutions hereafter. But uh, do you continue with that advocacy role, or does that advocacy role morph into the Commissioner for Crime? Those, I think, are some of the questions that need to be addressed before we all just rush uh, to embrace uh, a proposition which on its face is very attractive. Thank the member. And now I would call on the minister to respond. And the minister is up to 15 minutes to respond. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I am very grateful to the members for Upper Ban and Lagan Valley for bringing this motion before the House, as it affords me an opportunity to update members on progress following my announcement at the end of August that I was establishing a reference group to inform my approach with respect to introducing a Victims of Crime Commissioner, and I welcome, I welcome this opportunity to do so. 
When someone becomes a victim of crime, it is not just unexpected but shocking. As well as the trauma of the crime itself, many individuals are unfamiliar with the criminal justice system. Victims face emotional, practical and at times physical challenges and they need effective and appropriate support and assistance to help them navigate through the criminal justice system. Victims' voices also need to be heard so that we can better understand the impact of their experiences and can identify and put in place effective services to meet their needs. In what is an unusually short mandate of operational working in the Assembly and Executive, I have therefore prioritised within justice those elements of legislation, policy and practice which I believe will have the biggest positive tangible impact on victims of crime, both in terms of reduction of crime and improving the experience of victims as they pass through the system. I also spent time as I took up the role to meet with victims of crime, to listen to their experiences, good and bad, of the justice system, and have sought to embed those positive elements further and to address, in partnership with other parts of the justice family, those areas where the experience could be improved. Those meetings included with some of the victims who have already been referenced um, today, including Charles, L Charles Little and also um, uh, Enda Dolan's parents and many others also who have already led to change in policy and practice for victims going through the system. That is why I asked my victims, uh, or why I asked my officials in the summer to establish a reference group to advise and inform my thinking around the role and remit for victims of crime commissioner. After initial informal conversations with stakeholders from across the voluntary and community sector and statutory organisations, Partners who are already in daily contact with victims, I have written formally to them, inviting them to participate in the reference group. I have asked the group to advise me on what the potential role, remit and functions of a Victims of Crime Commissioner should be in order to improve the experience of victims, make their voices heard and represent their experience, needs and interest to government. I am keen that the group should also explore how best a potential Victims of Crime Commissioner could balance the challenge of representing the general interests of all victims of crime with a particular focus on the specific needs and requirements of vulnerable groups, for example, victims of domestic abuse, sexual offences or hate crime. Members will be aware of the good work already in place for victims of crime and will join me, I am sure, in paying tribute to the dedication of those across both non-governmental organisations and the criminal justice system who provide essential support to victims already. Their role does not stop there and I am also grateful for their collaboration in helping to inform our collective strategic response in order to improve the outcomes for victims in the criminal justice system. I think it is helpful to recognise this existing provision so that in thinking through the role of a Commissioner we seek to build on this rather than duplicate it. For me it is essential that a Victims of Crime Commissioner brings added value and makes a measurable difference to, vic difference to victims' experience within the criminal justice system, not simply duplicating existing arrangements. And I would have to say that for once Mr Alistair and I are of a mind in that regard. As such, I have asked the reference group to consider existing services available to victims of crime, identify any gaps, so that our focus can be on meeting genuine need, filling those gaps and improving the experience of victims. The reference group will meet later this month and in early November and will report to me by the end of December. Once I have considered their report, I will meet with the group in early January to discuss their advice prior to making decisions on the best way forward. With respect to the possibility of coupling our progress to the Westminster uh, legislation, that would not be the appropriate mechanism for a number of reasons. In England, much of the focus is on ensuring consistency across various services um, which are disparate in nature in the English scenario. However, here most of those are delivered by unitary authorities, making this less of a focus of any Victims of Crime Commissioner here, and in fact one of the reasons why Scotland has not ventured down that particular path. Further, I think we should look specifically at the needs of victims locally and what is already in place by way of service. With that in mind, I also want to answer the further question that was put to us about the potential conflation of Victims and Survivors Commissioner with Victims of Crime. I believe that the remit and the focus of the two roles are too, distant, are too different. I think that the needs and issues in respect of each cohort of victims are also very different. And our focus is very much on ensuring that the needs and interests of victims of crime going through the criminal justice system today are represented and provided for. I think conflating the two roles would not only lead to a lack of clarity about the purpose and functions of the role um, and dilute focus, but crucially would be unlikely to meet the needs or deliver improved outcomes for either cohort of victims effectively. 
Mr Speaker, while I said at the outset that I'm broadly supportive of this motion, there is one area where I would challenge the wording, and that is where the motion calls for all victims of crime to receive the same support. The needs of each victim are different, and therefore the available support should be appropriate to those needs, taking account of their experience, the crime type, their vulnerability, age and circumstances. One size does not fit all in these arrangements. I would therefore argue that the motion ought to agree that all victims of crime deserve to receive effective and proper support following a criminal offence being ter perpetrated against them and during any judicial proceedings. However, I do fully agree with the intent that all victims need and deserve support. Much excellent collaborative work is already in place to deliver this, and we continue to refine and improve the support available. This includes new work to introduce robust needs assessment from first contact with criminal justice organisations. This is a time when victims may feel particularly vulnerable, and that trauma and its effects are not always evident when the crime is reported. The new approach will ensure individual needs will continue to be reviewed and information shared with those criminal justice organisations with whom they will come into contact. When it comes to improving the criminal justice system for victims, my department and criminal justice organisations are not standing still. In terms of support for all victims of crime, my department provides significant funding of £1.9 million to Victim Support Northern Ireland to provide a range of support services to victims and witnesses. Over 50,000 victims and witnesses are offered help and support from victim support each year. And this support is available from when someone becomes a victim of crime through to when they are giving their evidence at court. Victim support also provides advocacy support for those who need assistance with issues as they journey through the system. Funding of £439,000 is also made available to the NSPCC Young Witness Service to provide tailored court support for all young prosecution witnesses who are called to give evidence. Around 500 young witnesses are supported each year to give their best evidence. My department also funds specific services to, to support victims of specific crimes, such as domestic and sexual abuse, hate crime, human trafficking and older people. For those who are vulnerable or have difficulty with communicating, my department provides registered intermediaries who are communication specialists that assist vulnerable children and adults with significant communication deficits to communicate their answers more effectively during police interview and when giving evidence at trial. In 2019-2020, there were 947 referrals to the scheme for victims, witnesses, suspects and defendants. All of these valuable services are aligned with the Victims' Charter, to which many have referred. I'm delighted to be in a position to take up this issue where my colleague David Ford left off. The hiatus, obviously, in the interim was beyond my control, but I'm passionate about taking it forward now. The Victims' Charter sets out the entitlements of victims, the services that are to be provided and the standard of services that victims should expect, as well as the obligations on a wide range of organisations to deliver information services and support. So it has impacted positively on victims because it has shaped the very service that they receive. It is not the case that it has been on the shelf. However, I am fully cognisant of the fact that more could be done to make victims aware of it. Clearly, we need to recognise where those improvements can be made and to take action to address those issues. And so I want to acknowledge the recent Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland report published in July and which highlighted a number of such issues, particularly around keeping victims informed about their case and raising awareness of the Victim and Witnesses Charter to enhance their impact and effectiveness. I want to thank particularly Gordon Dunn for more accurately, I think, reflecting the full landscape of the Sujeni report than some others. It did, of course, highlight areas for improvement. However, I think some members failed to read the rest of the report, where it actually noted that significant improvement had been made since the last report. It is important that we don't focus only on those areas where improvement is still required, but that we acknowledge to our partners and others where improvement has already been achieved. My officials are working closely with operational partners and support services to address these issues, and I plan to pu publish a multi-agency action plan, setting out our collective approach within the coming weeks. Hopefully that action plan will address the concerns which I and other members who spoke today share about awareness of the Charter in particular. In addition, the Department is continuing to work with partners to consider our overall strategic response to the issues affecting victims and witnesses within the criminal justice system. For those who have been victims of a sexual offence, 
One of my key priorities is to progress the implementation of the Gillen Review into the law and procedures in serious sexual offences. I am pleased that we now have published the implementation plan and established work streams. This will also require a wider discussion with other executive ministers to deliver the societal change on which it is based. Legislation is also progressing to implement elements of Gillen which require legislation and we hope that that will be part of the miscellaneous provisions bill. A wide range of work is being taken to, uh, to forward and good progress is being made a num against a number of those key recommendations. This includes work to allow vulnerable and intimidated victims and witnesses to provide evidence remote from the court building by the end of this year, as well as new arrangements for victims of serious sexual offences to be able to avail of publicly funded legal advice by the start of the next financial year. I will, yes. The Minister agree with me that other departments and other ministers need to do something similar in terms of putting together a working group to implement those recommendations which impact their own departments, particularly around education? I completely agree, and I would certainly welcome, whilst we take the lead on the Gillen Review, I would certainly welcome um, a, an act of interest from executive colleagues on the aspects where they can take this forward. Um, in terms of a particular issue with the justice system, is about progress and the speed with which cases can be taken forward. That matters to victims, witnesses, their family and their communities. It can also help offenders better understand the implications of their actions and create a better opportunity for rehabilitation. Therefore, speeding up justice is one of the biggest challenges facing the system, not least in the current context, and it is a priority for my department. Criminal Justice Partners and the Criminal Justice Board. Reducing the time it takes to complete criminal cases is a challenging and a complex issue, and reforms take time to embed for their impact to be seen. However, I'm focused on improving this through a number of programmes, for example, in terms of the Gillen Review and reforming committal reform. On domestic abuse, Obviously, I'm I am committed to tackling this abhorrent crime which affects many within society, and I'm also conscious that not everyone reports to the police. So I'm keen to ensure that victims have the confidence to pursue justice against those perpetrating these crimes. I also recognise the detrimental impact that COVID-19 continues to have on victims of domestic abuse and their greater vulnerability in this period, and I remain committed to ensuring that the most vulnerable have access to the services that they need and are aware of the support and help that is available to them, including the 24-hour domestic and sexual abuse helpline. Positive progress has also been made in implementing actions under the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse Strategy, and members will be aware of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill currently in committee stage. While I recognise that there have been calls for a Domestic Abuse Commissioner, I am not convinced that this is the most effective way to deliver support for those affected by this crime. With potential calls for multiple different commissioners to cover specific crime types, there could be a significant duplication of effort, whilst not necessarily making the best use of what are, and we have to recognise, very limited resources. Rather than given the common interests in terms of the needs of victims and how they are supported, I believe a general Victims of Crime Commissioner provides a better model to go forward. That what will be important is that this should focus on victims with specific vulnerabilities, such as domestic and sexual abuse. And that is why, as I've said, I've specifically tasked the reference group at looking at this issue of how to best balance the needs and interests of victims of crime more widely with a focus on particularly vulnerable groups. When people become crimes of, uh, victims of these crimes, which is a society we can no longer tolerate, it is essential that those affected have access to support services. That is also why I'm introducing a new advocacy support service to help victims of domestic and sexual abuse as they go through the criminal justice system. This new initiative will build on existing support services, providing a coordinated response to the needs of victims. Hate crime is another area where more can be done, both within the justice system and wider society, to challenge what is completely intolerable prejudice and hatred, and which at its most extreme can motivate people to commit serious offences against vulnerable people in the community. It's worth noting while the victim of crime itself may only, direct, <clears throat> may only be one or two, the fact and the perception that it was motivated by hate has the Minister much to draw remarks impact. to a close, please. Judge Marinan will be reporting to the Department in December um, on this matter. So I believe that there is an opportunity for a Victims of Crime Commissioner to be taken forward, and I look forward to updating members in future as to progress in that regard. I call Mike Nesbitt to wind on the motion and debate, and the member has up to ten minutes. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. I begin by declaring an interest as a former Commissioner uh, at the Commission for Victims and Survivors. 
I, I think it's worth beginning by recalling that um, in the build-up to devolution in 1998, huge effort was put into ensuring that these institutions are fair and equitable, free from discrimination and imbalance, and as John Blair put it, free from hatred. Uh, and also that we were just, and Mr. Fru uh, made much of the fact that we have to define the justice uh, in, in our dealings. But we made great efforts, and I think, for example, of Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act, which places duties on public bodies uh, to offer a quality of opportunity to nine named groups uh, within our society. But of course, there are always gaps. Uh, Mr. Alistair was one member who mentioned historical institutional abuse, and the, the hard inquiry did not cover everybody. Uh, there could have been a cleric who abused boy A in an institutional setting on a Monday morning, and then after lunch abused boy B in a domestic setting in the afternoon. Only boy A had recourse to heart. And in fact, a former junior minister uh, told a committee that boy B could go to the police or the social services, uh, a remark I find lacking perhaps in, in empathy, but certainly lacking in balance. And here we have another example of a gap. We have a commission for the victims and survivors of conflict-related incidents, but we don't have a victims commissioner, a commissioner for the victims uh, of crime. So I commend Mr. Beattie for bringing forward the motion with his usual logic, common sense, passion, and indeed moderation, uh, because as some members, uh, including Emma Rogan and Gemma Dolan pointed out, it's possible to support this motion uh, calling for a feasibility study without committing yourself to actually supporting the appointment of a victim's uh, commissioner. And Mr. Beattie uh, was passionate and grounded uh, in his remarks, talking about real victims like the family of Enda Dolan, the young man killed by a drug and drinks driver. The Victims' Charter was mentioned by many, beginning with Mr. Beattie, and I have heard two problems with it during the course of this debate. The first is a very practical one. Uh, Sinead Bradley, Gordon Dunn, Rachel Woods, Gemma Dolan all pointed out the Charter is not used properly, and more importantly, perhaps, it's not known about and understood by far too many victims, and Gemma Dolan was one who gave a solid evidence base with reference to this year's report by the Criminal Justice uh, Inspectorate. The second problem with the Victims' Charter, as Mr. Beatty put it, is that it's one half of a whole and the other half is missing. The other half is a champion to promote it. And that's why he thinks we should have a Victim of Crimes Commissioner. And without such a Commissioner, Mr. Beatty suggested that we could be lagging behind England and Wales. And I note Paula Bradshaw uh, spoke very positively of the impact that the Victims Commissioner has had in England and Wales, although the Minister has made clear that she would not be for repeating that model and just mimicking what is being done in England and gave her reasons uh, for that. The Victims Charter, as Mr Given, the Chair of the Justice Committee pointed out, was an idea that first came from a legacy Justice Committee which reported as long ago as 2012, a unanimous and comprehensive report, as he described it, uh, which included a call for the Charter, which was to come three years later, uh, in 2015. But how do we promote it? How do we assure a quality uh, of services? As Linda Dillon uh, pointed out, we want the same support and services uh, for all victims. Ms Dillon also pointed out that perhaps this motion would have been better uh, coming from the committee, as it might carry more weight. I would simply remind the member that the committee can actually bring forward legislation to introduce a commissioner for the victims of crimes, if she so wishes. The legacy committee of the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister a few years ago, 2016, I think, brought forward legislation that introduced the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. So there is a precedent uh, for committees uh, taking this action, if they so wish. But the minister suggests it probably will not be necessary because she is committed to what she is calling her reference group. And when Emma Rogan asked for a timeline, the minister provided one. It appears the reference group is due to report to her in December of this year, and in January of 2021, she will meet with them uh, to discuss 
uh, a way forward. I would just say to, to the Minister that she appeared to suggest that we should not conflate the Commission for Victims and Survivors of the Conflict uh, with this proposed Commissioner, suggesting that perhaps the needs of the two sets of victims are different. Uh, as a former Commissioner uh, at the Commission for Victims and Survivors, I can tell her I have spent many, many hours listening to victims, repeating the most horrific, traumatised stories of their engagements with the criminal justice system. Uh, a woman who was very badly damaged in the Oma bomb, going to court for compensation, being told by our solicitor, uh, a bit of paper will be put in front of you, it will have your initial offer of compensation, just ignore it, because it's a game and I play the game, you don't know how to do it, trust me. And the paper was put in front of her, and she decided she would ignore it. But then the judge asked her to remove her dress so he could look at her injuries. He's not a doctor. The NHS had provided the file of the injuries, and yet he humiliated her by asking her to remove her dress. And the consequence was she lifted the bit of paper and she accepted the offer because she could not face going back in for another session. So I think we need to be very clear about the experiences of victims and survivors of crime and of conflict-related crime. And Alan Chambers uh, was very clear about the potentially traumatic experience of engaging in the criminal justice system. And Rachel Woods made reference to the Gillen Review and the effect of re-traumatization on so many people uh, who are victims of crime. So I think overall we, we need to welcome uh, this debate. Uh, broadly speaking, welcome uh, the Minister's response, uh, because with the reference group, it does appear that we are working our way towards uh, the potential appointment of a Victims of Crime uh, Commissioner. Mr. Alistair has some good points and questions uh, about how it fits into uh, the current framework. Uh, but I finish once again by commending uh, Mr. Beattie, not only on bringing forward the motion, but wording it in such a way uh, that it appears he will get universal support. When Mr. Alistair begins remarks with pronouncing himself not at all hostile to a motion, you must know you're onto a winner. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for that. And um, the question now is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it and the motion is agreed. Uh, if members just take their ease now while we move to the next item of business.